Hi, this is Mike Stash. That's me. Who's the list owner of Running on Empty Oz. Uh, we're at his property uh, in the house that he's built. I, I thought it would be worth uh, asking Mike a few questions about how he got to here. In, in 1990, I had a really successful photographic business. I was a photographer. I moved in with another photographer. And between us, we probably had the best studio in Brisbane. We could photograph trucks. It was that big. We had heaps, wow. of, heaps of lighting power. We had our own coloured lab, dark rooms. Um, it, was, it was really something special. But then we had the recession we had to have, 1990. Yeah. Even though I kept telling myself and everybody else that I wasn't going to participate in this recession, half my best clients went broke. And um, all of a sudden, you know, my turnover couldn't pay my debts. I started to get quite disillusioned with the whole thing. And so we decided that we'd leave Brisbane and go to the Mount Nebo. And I and I met one person in particular at Mount Nebo, his name's Bruce, fantastic fellow, really, really clever man, mm -hmm. um, who lives off nothing, pretty much like I do now. <laughs> he, uh, he's a blacksmith, um, and he, he milled all this timber. He, uh, he even made the timber mill, I, I mean, from scraps from the tip. You know, he found all this scrap material at the tip, built built this uh, mill, he introduced me to solar power, um, his house is fully solar powered, and also introduced me to a TAFE course where you could actually learn about solar power. So at the time it was an advanced certificate, the certificate four, I guess they call, they call them now, uh -huh. uh, in renewable energy technology, and it was such a complex course that I reckon it should just be a degree actually. But anyway, I, I did that course. And in the process, I learned how to design energy efficient houses, which is what this, this house is. Well, how to design a house to be efficient. Yeah. And um, it occurred to me that a lot more gains could be made in reducing greenhouse emissions from going efficient rather than screwing solar panels on people's roofs. Yes. And I've always been a bit of a frustrated architect. I mean, my favourite uh, facet of photography was actually architecture. I really liked architectural photography. Oh, yes. So I was always a frustrated architect, and I, and I had a, before I was a photographer, I was a draftsman. I did that for 10 years, worked for the civil servant, public servants. Drove me nuts, nearly, nearly drove me insane. Um, anyway, that's another long story. Yes. Um, so I knew how to draw house plans and all this kind of stuff. So I thought I'd, I'd you know, give up photography and branch out into this, l l knowing little about the building industry and what a stupid industry it is. Oh, yes. Where really builders don't give a stuff about what they're doing. You know, they, they're only interested in making money. I mean, let's face it, that's what the rest of the world is like too. Yeah. And as far as they were concerned, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We're making lots of money building this, this, these crappy houses and we'll just continue. And that, nobody was interested in anything I had to say. And trying to compete with the building industry, you know, is like trying to build kites to compete with Boeing. Yeah. You know, it's just not, not, not possible. So uh -huh. I, I've designed a dozen houses, and that's about it. I mean, I, I just could not get my business off the ground. And also, I realised that it was possible to design houses like this one that are so efficient you can't make them any better. Oh, great. But no one would believe me. It's like saying, I can design an aeroplane that will fly to Mars, and of course no one would believe you. Of course not, no. Well, um, but of course, you can't fly an aeroplane to Mars. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll, I'll build one and show them. And to cut a long story short, we ended up buying this block of land, and and I started building this house, which which was a challenge because of the lay of the land. Talking two thousand three, four. Yeah. Okay. So I'd known about peak oil for three or four years, but to be honest, it just went straight over my head. I forget. I wish I'd actually I'd written it down. But the day the penny dropped with me about peak oil, I remember it really well because I couldn't sit still. I was like walking around the house thinking. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Like this is, you know, I, I'd realised that. How did it drop? Well, see, uh, because I'd learned all this stuff about solar power, I really thought that with solar power one day we, we would save the world, that we would have a solar powered world and, and everything would be fine, we'd stop the greenhouse effect. And, um, yeah, I, I, I really thought that we would have this solar powered utopia one day. Mm -hmm. And then I suddenly realised that it couldn't happen because because it takes so much energy and it, in fact 
every single solar panel, every single windmill, anything that generates power is 100% made with fossil fuels. Yes. So all the solar panels that are screwed to this house would be impossible to make unless you had fossil fuels. And if we're not going to have fossil fuels in the long term, yes. how are we going to have solar panels? Or anything else? That matter? So, so the complexity of the system that we live in now totally depends on fossil fuels. And if they're no longer available, well, there's just not going to be a complex system. So why can't we... Exactly. If I ask you, why can't we use solar energy or wind power to manufacture more solar because, power? Because the system's too complex. See, wind power, wind turbines and solar panels only make electricity. You cannot do everything that we do with electricity. Cars don't run with electricity. Bulldozers don't run electricity. If you want to make solar panels, you have to mine sand. Mm. You, have to, you have to get the silicon. And that's the other aspect of it too. The, 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 you can't, why can't you mine it with solar? Mine well, solar you see, the, the other thing that occurred to me is the monumental problem we have, the absolute monumental quantities of energy that we use now, people have no understanding of. You know, the, 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 if you look at the total amount of solar power and wind turbines installed in the world now, right, everything that's been built so far, and don't forget, it's growing at about 24% per annum, right? So, it's growing really big time. Well, everything that is installed now is less than the growth in energy demand in 12 months. Mm. So, so, even though renewable energy is growing at 24% per annum, it can't even keep up with the growth. Because the base, see the growth is only 3%, but the base is huge. So 3% of heaps and heaps and heaps is so much more than 24% of a small amount that it's, it just can't be done. Basically, it's too late. See, the way I look at it is, in 1970, the Club of Rome said to us that, that over a period of 100 years, um, the whole system would collapse for all sorts of reasons. And yes. they, did, they did about, from memory, I think they did about 12 or 13 or 14 different scenarios where they analysed what if this happens and what if that happens. Yeah. And it didn't matter what, you know, what relationships, all you know, pollution and, and, and the population and uh, resource use and energy use and all these things had in relation to each other. Yeah. It didn't matter which way you, you went. They still added up to the same quantity. They still ended up that within 100 years there would be a collapse. Yes. And of course, at around that time, I also read that book, um, and it's obvious to me now that if we had actually heeded what they said in 1970, we, had some we actually could have been in with a chance of doing it, yes. because then yes. we still had all the resources, Yes, we had a third of the population, Yes. So we wouldn't have to feed so many people, we didn't, we have, didn't, have, we didn't have to make so much stuff, we didn't have to make so much energy. But it's too late now. We've dug ourselves into Most this gigantic hole. Most people were living hole. almost sustainably. I mean, they just hadn't grown their expectations and their footprint mm. nearly to the same degree. Yeah. And they hadn't destroyed the na their natural surroundings yeah. to the same extent. See, now that we've got nowhere to go. We've got nowhere to go. Like, all this talk on rolls about hunter-gathering, it's all fine. I mean, I agree. Well, that's after the Great Collapse. Uh, hunter-gathering, yeah, but, where would, like, say everything collapsed now, where would I go and to hunt and gather. Well, you'd have to wait until the great die off through a massive pandemic. Yeah, but I'll, yeah, but I'll probably be dead too then. Well, yes, you did. I'm very philosophical about death now because you know, I finally worked out that no one gets out of this game alive anyway, so yeah, yeah. I'm going to die, I'm going to die, yeah. So, I, if there's one thing I'd like, I'd like to live to be 154, it's to, to see, see what, what happens. happens. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to see how this all pans out. I'm really curious. <laughs>